Hello everyone and welcome back to day 14 of Bitwise where we build a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, for those of you who watched day 13 last stream, uh, you'll note we had some technical difficulties to say the least. Uh, in, in the first half of the stream, I started doing a walkthrough and a demo of VTune. And then we got somehow got my computer into a state where performance had tanked, my fan was permanently spun up, and no other profilers could apparently run. And so it looked like uh, VTune had gotten itself into some sort of state it couldn't recover from, and we had to reboot. And then that split the stream into two parts, and then the second part I didn't record locally, so I had to download it from Twitch for the YouTube upload. Uh, just a disaster all around. But um, at the very, very end, um, we actually did get to something really cool that I've been wanting to do for a while. It turned out to be pretty simple once the scaffolding had been built. Um, and that was the ability to... Um, to basically synchronize the line information between ion code and the generated C code so we can do things like debugging at the ion level. And so um, um, before we, we get to that and some of the other changes since last time, um, just a few uh, admin comments, I guess. Uh, a bunch of people have been requesting more homework like the one we did in week one. Um, I had on honestly kind of forgotten about it, partly because I got more busy with my own coding. Uh, and also because I noticed that there was, you know, quite a lot of people who were saying that, um, you know, publishing or whatever you want to say, assigning more homework, it kind of melt, made them feel like they were falling behind. Um, and, uh, you know, not everyone has the ability to commit as much time to working on that stuff as others. And so I kind of intentionally let out, let the gas off a little bit on that. Um, but uh, some homework will be returning. And uh, I, I don't have anything for today, but I'm kind of thinking about what would be a good point to assign more. I think next week would be ideal because I'm hoping to, I've mentioned this a few times, I'm planning on working pretty intent, uh, intensely this week through the weekend for me locally. Uh, so basically maybe until, I guess that will be like Saturday US time or Sunday, my own time or Europe time uh, on, the, on kind of getting version zero of ION into a decent shape. And so that means that by next week, maybe I can actually assign homework writing stuff in ION. And so th I think that would be fun maybe. And I would get a bunch of beta testers that way. Uh, and so uh, stay tuned for that next week. There will be more homework to come. All right. Um, let me quickly review uh, check-ins from last time. I think actually most of the changes have not yet been checked in. Um, but let me see what I did check in. OK, there's actually a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, so there's some stuff that was just people were pointing out that I wasn't doing and I'm now doing. Uh, all switch uh, all, all switch case blocks now have an, an implied break at the end, um, uh, which was always the intention. I don't think those C semantics are particularly uh, valuable. Um, right now, there's no way to do intentional fall through. I mean, once we implement go to, you can do a go to, but uh, it's so rare that I need that that I don't think it's really needed for version zero anyway. Um, another thing is, and I think this eventually got um, changed yet again in a later check-in. Uh, I guess I don't really have a good before and after sample, but let me just show you what it looks like now. So I did a bunch of work on um, improving the way the C code is generated. Um, and so if you look at uh, a file now, the structure is, first off, the for declaration section has much less than before. It only has unions and structs. So it doesn't have function for declarations. Um, for, for declarations for functions are now intermingled with the sorted declarations of everything else. And the reason is I realized that you actually need to do this because admittedly this is perverse, but it's nevertheless something that I wanted to support and something that C actually supports as well, which is you could do stuff like this. Let me show you the ion code so you see what, what this is actually doing. Um, and I'm doing it here out of order just to exercise the, um, the order resolving. But you can declare like a type def, for example, of a type, which is an array of ints. And this, the size of the int array is the return value of a function h, which is int. So this is going to be uh, an array of four ints, right? Because size of int is four. Uh, and so this kind of thing here means that you cannot actually have this type def until you've seen the declaration of h. Um, and so, um, and, and of course, the four declarations themselves can also refer to type defs. So in this case, G um, has a reference to U, and, and U is a type def 
uh, of, of this union we defined earlier. And so anyway, because of all of this, I realized that actually uh, function declarations have to be sorted, uh, you know, there's sort of bidirectional dependencies that are possible and they have to be sorted along with everything else we, we sort. And that was really easy to make. I don't think the change actually uh, really, like the code was not really complicated. It was just a case of changing where it was called. So if you now go to resolve decal, I think it is. Uh, resolve decal func now does um, there's a tub level is it resolve sim right this thing here I think this code used to get called from in the for declaration section and now it gets called as part of the main resolver code path that was really the only change for that um, and then as before we have the function definitions uh, separately all the way at the end uh, and so now the functions are segregated at the end. Uh, so that was one change, and and that was that kind of felt better. I also renamed some stuff here to be more evocative, I guess, uh, and added some some code samples to test one that I on to exercise that code. Um, yeah, this is just a small bug thing, and some test cases, and removed some test code that was no longer needed. Um, the other thing we did, which is, I guess, what wasn't checked in. Um, Um, let's see here. Um, oh, right. Let me just flip through this now. We'll visit it in a second. Um, okay, there's actually a bunch of stuff. All right. Um, one thing we did is uh, we do a better job of generating cleaner, um, cleaner pound line directives. And this actually ended up helping out some other code as well. And directly... Um, so previously in our, in our it, I think I renamed it from gen post to gen sync post. So it's like synchronized position. And now the position is not just a line, but it includes the file name as well. And so what this will do is it will only emit the file name if it already doesn't have the right file name. So you can see up here, it only emits um, the file name part the first time it needs. And then subsequently it just emits the line number. So it's, it's less, I mean, l l less repetitive and also less file size. Um, and that's the main thing. As part of this, I had to do, I, I had been punting this and it's still not uh, fully, comp I mean, it's still not like industrial strength or whatever, but I had to do at least some work to generate properly es escaped uh, quoted strings because uh, my workflow is generating these absolute paths on Windows, which have backslashes. And so um, because of that, I had to do at least a basic uh, escaping uh, a function for strings and again it's it's by no means complete but it does some basic stuff it does you know uh, note well the stuff i needed is actually escape backslashes but it also does uh, single and double quotes and new lines for now all right um i think that was the main thing there uh, another thing i fixed i mean i guess it was it was broken but i um th there's going to be a bunch more cases like these i just haven't found but um one case I fixed was uh, this. So um, if you declare a, 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 um, a variable with a type that does not have a, a specified uh, size, then it will infer the size of that array from the initializer. Um, and this is kind of an interesting case because you know if you wrote something like this in C, you would expect this to say, oh, the array has size three. But if you actually have designated initializers, then, um, I mean, this actually works in C as well. This will, uh, in C, this would infer a size of 11, uh, one past the maximum index. And so this works now as well. And you can see if you look at the corresponding code. Right now, I'm actually emitting the 11. I'm not emitting, you know, this would be legal as well. Uh, and I should do that eventually. But right now, it's just emitting the actual inferred size. Um, but you can see it does that and, and that all compiles. Uh, and the way that worked, it was a very small change. I think I just had to, in the resolver, uh, add in this code that handles compound literals. In addition to this index counter, I have a max index and it just keeps track of the maximum index we've seen, either uh, an auto incremented index or an explicit index from a designated initializer. And then if, uh, if the array has no designated size, um, we uh, replace that by a a, a, a corresponding version of that array type that has the max index plus one as the size. So that's how that works um, for now. And again, probably going to uh, improve that a little bit um, by not emitting the, you know, we, we want to actually emit 
something equivalent to this rather than end 11 here um, so that we don't hard code that. I mean, it's not a big deal, but um, it's, it's fine for now at least. Um, uh, a few other things. I added this comma notation for cases. So previously, if you wanted to do the equivalent of this, you had to do you know this. Since we don't have comma expressions, uh, you can still do this, by the way, but you can also use commas. They're just uh, much more, this is just a much more compact notation. And uh, on the C code, they just generate, um, they just generate this. So it's just the shorthand, um, which I thought was, was nice. It's nice that we don't have comma expressions. I guess you could support this in C as well, but um, because you do something similar in function calls where commas are not comma expressions, but separators. But anyway, uh, that is supported. Um, what else? Maybe that's it. There's probably a few other things. I, oh yeah, one thing I changed uh, actually a couple of days ago that I didn't note is that maybe I'm already using it here. Yeah, it's in this code, um, which I'm not gonna... Un the problem is this generates warnings on the C side. And I would rather avoid that right now. Eh, maybe I should. Um, maybe I should. Eh. Actually, let's just not deal with that for now. But anyway, uh, cast now looks more like ccast. So previously there was a cast keyword, and now you just use this notation. So we were already using this uh, uh, parenthesis colon notation for um, for size of and uh, compound initializers, right? So if you want to have a compound initializer, oh, I should mention this works as well. Um, let me show you so it actually compiles. Hopefully, um, if you do. You can do it this way, but you can also do, um, if you're so inclined, you can also do, I mean, you can do something like like this. That should work. It generates the same C code. Um, right, it generates the same C code. And just to show that it's not, hopefully it's actually regenerating it. If, if I do something like this, it should generate like an array of size 124. So anyway, so you can do that too. So that's the compound initializer notation. And now if you use this with, you know, you can you can now use this uh, for casting as well. And I don't know why I chose not to do that originally. I think originally I was trying to have slightly different conversion and cast rules than C. But as, as, as the design for Ion progressed, I just decided let's have something that's exactly like C where it makes sense. And so why not just have a similar notation as well? It's, it's much more compact and it looks familiar to C programmers, so why not? So anyway, that was changed. That was a very small change in the parser. I think really the only thing that had to change was here. Um, so this is the, the thing that previously matched parenthesized expressions and compound literals. And now you can see um, if after this uh, parenthesis colon thing, there is an open, uh, brace, then we treat it as a compound literal. Otherwise, we just treat it as a cast. So one line change, and we had to, we could throw out all the other stuff involving cast keywords. So, anyways, that was something that happened a few days ago as well. All right, um, enough for the diffs. I wanted to actually demo. I, I I did this briefly at the end of the last stream, but it's now in a much better shape, and I think I can do a better demo. Uh, and it's I think it's really cool, even though it's not. That, I mean, it's not that fancy in terms of the technical underpinnings, but it's really useful and really cool. So let me demo, uh, let me demo kind of the fruits of all this work we did for the line synchronization, or actually not that much work. It was mostly just uh, fixing the AST to track line information correctly and then emit those pound line directives in the C code. But now that we have uh, we have all this pound line uh, info. The C compiler and transitively, not just the C compiler, but um, the debugger, the profiler, all these other tools that consume debug info, which you know on Windows is from PDB files, on uh, Linux and, and Mac, I, I, no, I guess Mac doesn't use Dwarf. Whatever it uses, it uses its own format. No, or is it Dwarf? I can't remember. Um, but anyway, whatever debug info format you use on your platform uh, is ultimately going to be informed by these pound line directives. And so, that gives us massive leverage. So even though we're using the C compiler, we uh, we can still essentially debug uh, the the code and profile the code as if it we as if it were Ion code and everything was designed for Ion, which is great. Um, so compared to what I demoed uh, at the end of last stream, I have a slightly better workflow. Uh, I have a separate test project which I had before, um, but I have like a custom build step now for one of them where um, it will actually 
you know, run the ion compiler on test1.ion to generate the C code. Uh, and then when this thing is set at startup, it's actually going to run it. Um, and uh, compared to last time, I guess I also exposed get char. So we have both input and output, um, but this is just simple test stuff. But anyway, um, so let me show the debugging first, which is by far the most useful. And then we'll show profiling in a second. So, um, uh, you know, I've been hammering the drum on control F10 as a really convenient way of doing debugging. Well, it just works for us here as well. So if I do control F10 on the first line, uh, I guess it has to rebuild because we changed some stuff. Uh, we're now on the debugger on the first line before this uh, put statement. If I press uh, Alt 8 to show the uh, disassembly, you can see we're seeing the generated disassembly uh, code uh, next to uh, the ion source code. So that all just works. Uh, if I do, well, I, l let's try it. But if I do um, F11 to step into puts, it's going to step into the, well, it's going to step into this stuff here. Uh, let's step out. But anyway, it, it can step into system functions. Um, and uh, example test is our own function. So let's step into that. This calls a recursive and iterative version of a factorial function. And um, and verifies that they return the same value. So let's set a permanent breakpoint in the iterative version here. Um, or actually, let's just use Control F10 to go here. So now we're here. And uh, you can see if we go to the locals window, uh, you can see the parameter uh, n, which is an int, is here. And you can see the value. So far, r has not been initialized. Um, and so if we step over that line, we now have a definite value for r. And uh, now there's this loop that has 10 iterations. And you can see as we step through, all these things get updated as you'd expect. And if we step past the loop, we can see the final value that's going to be returned. And that all just works. And again, I mean, it's not really something we can claim credit for because it's just using the existing tool chain. But the point is that Poundline makes this possible really easily. Um, and the, the fact that Ion, you know, Poundline is, is one thing, but if the language, we were compiling and the C code we were generating was um, very much unlike C, this would be less useful, right? Um, like if this was Lisp or some other weird language that doesn't have you know, native types and it doesn't have a, a model um, that's kind of comparable to C semantics, then you would still be able to do something like this, but what the, compi what the C compiler would be seeing would be so alien to the original language that even with pound line directives, the debugging experience would probably be uh, uh, pretty terrible to be honest so it's really two things that are giving us this seamless workflow one is the pound line stuff for sure but the other part is that the, the code we're generating is pretty much exactly uh, like it corresponds very closely to the uh to the c code or sorry the c code corresponds to the ion code so it's really that two-part formula anyway so now we're stepping out and um yeah so we we printed that first line now we're printing the second and uh, if I go into get char, now we have to type something to proceed, and we're done. And uh, yeah, now we're in the CRT assembly code. Um, anyway, so um, and because you know, because I mean, you could do this with a make file as well. But like you know, I can iterate on this code. Like if I if I remove this and now Control F10, it recompiles and it goes indirectly. Um, so you know, this is already pretty useful. Like in terms of if if I was doing something more useful than just putting t strings on the screen and stuff and, and reading characters and computing stupid factorial values, this this workflow would actually be uh, would be pretty decent, right? Um, all right, so that's for debugging. I just wanted to show you, even though this is going to be kind of a a stupid example, um, uh, I just wanted to show you that um, uh, you can also do profiling again due to the same information. Like nothing new, really. Um, and actually, let me first expose. No, let's not. This is hard code of value. Um, uh, and yeah, so so let's say uh, let's let's do a loop that does a bunch of iterations, like a billion iterations or so. Um, and it, let's compute a factorial as well. Actually, um, let's compute a billion factorial, uh, which is going to wrap around, obviously, but. Um, or not like that. Let's do this. Um, something like this. And we can recompile, and hopefully that works. And you can see, you know, now we have we have this code here. And yeah, let's return zero just to be nice. 
Um, and I'm going to I'm going to be debugging it in debug mode, even though that's obviously a no-no normally. Um, actually, let, let me call this benchmark. Um, so we can see the call stack stuff coming into play. Um, all right, and let's say benchmark two to the th uh, 30th. And let's just see that runs first of all. It's not going to, you know, it takes maybe a second or two. Um, because we're running in debug, this is all constant. And in fact, if we run and release, the compiler is almost certainly going to just eliminate that code entirely. Um, but um, l let me just, uh, even again, debug uh, profiling in debug mode is a sin and shouldn't be done. But uh, just since we know the code is running pretty slow and I want to show something that runs for more than a, a microsecond or whatever, uh, let's just try profiling it. So this is just you know profiling like we were doing before, but now using this as a startup project. You can see it's warning us not to use debug, but uh, we 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 do that intentionally, and uh, it's now going to profile all this stuff. And uh, you can see, we, I mean, obviously there's not much going on here, but it's the same kind of breakdown we had for a C code. And if I go and look at this code and says, okay, what what lines are actually doing the work? You can see that here. Uh, and and I'm, I don't know how accurate you know this assignment is, but you know this is probably related to some of the control flow and and some of the map. So you can see the multiplies seem to be doing the the bulk of the work, but there's some other work assigned to these lines. Uh, if you, what's the? I think there's a way to look at the assembly line stuff, or maybe there isn't in Visual Studio. Um, but anyway, so you, you can do that sort of thing. And that just works. Again, it didn't have to do any extra work. Once we have the pound line stuff set up, it just works, which is pretty neat, I think. Um, all right, I think that's it as far as the demo I wanted to do. Let me just see if there's any questions before I get into today's topic and the work we'll be doing today. Um, let's see here. Um, boom, 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 boom. Um, someone's asking for what pound line is designed for. Well, I mean, I, I think the 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 case. Um, I, I mean, I, I demoed this last time, but I can show it quickly again. If you do, if you run the C preprocessor. Um, If you run the C preprocessor on a file, um, you get these. So you're actually, this is how the C, C preprocessor communicates to the C compiler. I tested this after the stream. This, is, this directive here is kind of the equivalent of pound line, but it's only, you, you can't pass that to the C preprocessor. It can only be passed directly to the C compiler, um, you know, between the CPP and the C, uh, and the C compiler. But it's kind of the equivalent of this. So yeah, when you do pound includes and stuff, um, the um you you know it has to it flattens everything right it inlines everything so it has to communicate where those things are to the c compiler so it can you know generate the right error messages if there's compiler errors or warnings and also so you know where uh, in the debugger and the profiler where things originally come from because the c compiler is just seeing this fully inlined garbage um so that's part of it um but given that this is only between the c preprocessor and the c compiler that's not really what pound line is for, right? But pound line is was one case I know where it's used in, is yak and lex. So, um, I mean, yak and lex, which are you know kind of I guess semi pertinent to the, to the stream, is like they're uh, a lexer and a, par, a, a parser generating tool. And uh, lex and yak uh, definitions can have uh, snippets of C code in line, which are executed when certain rules are firing, and um, when uh, when Lex and Yak generate C code, because they generate C code that's compiled by the C compiler, they use pound line in order to say, hey, uh, you know, the uh, this snippet of code originally came from line 15 of 
uh, foo.y or whatever Yak's file extension is, or yy, I guess. Um, and so I, I know that's it's used for that. So it's used for all of these kind of compiler generating tools, basically. Um, and it's interesting that more languages don't have a feature like this, if you think about it. Uh, JavaScript has something called source maps, but it's it was added. It's sort of an unofficial standard, I think. Um, and source maps are not. I think they're not inline. They're kind of a separate file on the side um, that you can specify, um, so that you know. Because remember, nowadays I guess it's I guess with TypeScript it's still uh, significant. But you know, for, there was a while there before ES6 where everyone was using CoffeeScript or whatever, like all, the, all these other transpilers in order to make uh, JavaScript more uh, easy to use. And um, and for a while those didn't have a good way to do debugging and de profiling. And so they added source maps, which is this unofficial extension that serves a similar purpose to pound line, right? So it's for cases like this. It works definitely well, good for um, uh, code generating tools uh, and, and transpilers and stuff like this. All right. Um, let's see. Um, someone was also mentioning that NIM, which I don't know a whole lot about, but I know it's a new language um, that's designed for systems programming and it generates both. It can generate C and it can generate other target languages, I think. Someone was mentioning that um, apparently debugging NIM code is not very convenient right now. And they were asking why can't they do the equivalent of pound, I, uh, pound line to get a similar workflow. And the answer is, I mean, I don't know. Uh, so may and maybe they do do that, uh, but I also don't know if the way they generate their C code is so dissimilar to their original NIM code that it's less useful. Is basically I don't know, but um, in theory you can do this for any language, but it works better if the source language and the target language are you know more similar, basically. All right. Um, Right, and, and and you also want, I would say, especially for local variables, this is actually something that will have to change for us once we support packages and namespacing and stuff. But, um, you know, if you step into a function, uh, right now, both the globals and the locals have the corresponding names. Um, why didn't that run? Oh, I guess we removed it. Um, let me just step into it there. Right now, the locals and globals have the corresponding names in the NIM side and the C side. Um, so you can see it's N and R, and it, it's I for this iterator and so on. Uh, that's going to remain true for local variables always, but for global variables, uh, we will eventually need to do some prefixing. But it's going to be pretty predictable, right? Like the globals will have like package name underscore on the C side, um, and there won't be the I mean, it'll mostly be functions, not, there won't be that many global variables, right? It'll mostly be functions. And so uh, the main effect is that the call stack will have these name prefixes on them. Right now, they just have the verbatim names from the ion code. But the uh, local variables are always going to be one-to-one -one, and uh, globals, packaged globals are going to be name prefixed, uh, which is still pretty predictable and intuitive. So uh, yeah, keeping names and stuff like that uh, equivalent is pretty important. You can imagine if you have a compiler that generates C code, and it generates a lot of random temporary variables that have no resemblance, like they're just called T1, T2, T3, like just some random temp variable names. Uh, they, they would show up in the locals window here and that would be a major hassle, right? Like because the actual locals that you declared would be completely buried in trash of all these temporaries. So that's an example of why, you know, in order to really benefit from this, you definitely want to try to keep things one-to-one -one as much as possible. All right. Um, Let's move on to the thing I wanted to, to, to do today. And uh, I'll be, I plan to do this on the extra stream as well. So we'll start, start it on the mainstream and then move, uh, move forward with it on the extra stream as well. So um, we have the resolver and right now the, the type resolver is, you know, it, it, it's, it's not claiming to be complete or bug free or anything, but it kind of has the, um, you know, it has most of the big stuff uh, in some in some shape or another. Uh, one thing it doesn't have right now is support for the breadth of integer, uh, well, er, er, numeric types generally, like uh, different integer types and different float types. And one reason I punted on that um, was my original plan for how to handle that was to be, um, I guess, slightly different from C, like enforcing more. Um, more explicit conversions rather than implicit promotions and arithmetic conversions the way C does it. 
Uh, and part of the linchpin of that approach was going to be Go and Swiss style untyped literals um, uh, and, and constant expressions. And um, I think I mentioned this on previous streams, but as I consider the implications of doing that when you're generating C code, it seems to become less and less reasonable to do so in a clean way. Um, and so given that I've kind of retreated to doing things in a more C-like style, I decided let's actually just do, and uh, let's do arithmetic stuff more or less like C, maybe with a few exceptions, but basically the core of it in terms of the integer promotions and the usual arithmetic conversions, let's actually do it the same way it works in C for version zero. And maybe we'll add some tighter checking for some things, but basically let's try to keep that one-to-one. -one. Um, which means that increasingly Ion is turning into sort of a tutorial on how to write most of a C compiler, which is fine by me, by the way, because like I mentioned in the very first stream, originally I was planning on making making a C compiler instead of Ion because I'm not necessarily looking to design a language. I'm looking to, sh to show people how to implement stuff. Um, so it, we'll, we'll still, there's still huge advantages to what we're doing in terms of um, of, of not literally following C in some areas. But uh, Increasingly, as I've thought about it, I don't feel bad about re re retreating to C semantics for some of this stuff. Um, we may we may enforce some st more strictness for certain f famous ca infamous cases of, of uh, that are sources of bugs. But anyway, that's kind of the background on why I've been punting on it, and now I've just kind of uh, decided that hey, let's just do something very similar to C for this and. Uh, I also needed to study up more on how C works to make sure that, well, I, I kind of knew, but you know, I needed to study up to the point where I could write a compiler for it. Um, so first, um, let me just talk about the relevant parts of the C standard. Um, and someone asked this last time I showed it. Uh, I think you have to pay money to get the final version of the C standard, but you can get the draft, the drafts very, very, um, well, you can just download the drafts of the official website. Um, if you search for draft standard or just here, right? So if you sort if you Google for say C11 standard, uh, you can get this link here, which is the same file I'm looking at. And um, this is the committee draft. It's not the final version, but it's available freely for download. Um, and if you're if you're if you're trying to look at the parts that have more or less stayed the same for 10 years or whatever even though it's a draft. I mean, I assume the way they make the drafts is that they take the final version of the previous standard and they add and it, they add changes to it. So uh, I, I assume that for the core parts, this is essentially final because they're not going to, to muck around with the stuff that's been the same in C since the 80s, right? Um, all right. So, um, okay, let me, let me think about where to start here. Uh, let me first just write some code snippets to, to, to show you the kind of thing that I have in mind. Um, this is something that, you know, when, when did I start programming in C? I started doing a little bit of C programming maybe when I was 12 or 13. And at the time, I didn't have any proper way to teach myself. Um, I basically just, uh, I was really into... Um, I was really into the thing that got me to look at C was, uh, I guess, Dikumud, which was, it's kind of a precursor. It's like a text-based MMO, basically. Um, but um, um, this came with source code, and it was written in C. And uh, I just kind of learned from looking at the source code. Uh, in hindsight, the code is not very good, but it has the benefit of being kind of very raw. It doesn't have any interpreted languages or whatever. And so you, if you wanted to do pretty much anything except just uh, do data definition, you had to go and write C code. And the good news is the C code is pretty straightforward. But, um, you know, I basically learned C originally by just kind of making changes and not knowing what I was doing. And in particular, I remember pointers. I, know, I, I didn't really know what pointers were. So the way I would get stuff to work was... Um, I would make a change and nine times out of 10, it would result in a sec fault. And I didn't know how to debug things. I would just revert the change and uh, try it again until it worked, if it ever, if I could ever get it to work. So that was the way I, I, I learned, which is not a very good way to learn. But um, even after, I mean, eventually, I guess I tried to read uh, the Kernigan, uh, Kernahan and Ritchie book, uh, The C Programming Language. But that book is, uh, especially for a kid, is very hard. Uh, and I think even for good programmers who are adults, it's not an easy book at all. Um, but the, I guess the point is that I never really learned C formally um, 
until fairly recently, like maybe the last 10 years. Uh, and so I, I, I think that's how most people learn it, actually. They just sort of pick stuff up and agglomerate knowledge over time and learn what to avoid. And they often program in a subset of the language so that they don't truly have to learn the language in, in full. And um, I kind of gave an example of that when we were generating C-type declarations of how um, I, I, you know, this is extrapolating from my personal experience, but you know, people tend to learn these fragments of the language where they're comfortable in, and they kind of can put them together to do what they want, but they never really understand, necessarily understand the full semantics. And most of the time, that's fine. Um, so an example of that for me, at least, where for a long time I don't think I fully understood what how C works because you can get away with a partial understanding for a very long time, is the way the so-called integer promotions. Uh, and uh, usual arithmetic conversions work. So um, suppose you have u and 8, uh, you know, you have some u and 8s, and I, I could write these as chars, right? But I'm just going to write u and 8 to be very specific. Or maybe I will write them as chars, actually. Um, so what is the type of a plus b? Um, you know, intuitively, you might say, well, A is a char and B is a char, so A plus B is a char, right? That seems reasonable. That's how most things work when you think of kind of like there's a closure property of these arithmetic conversions, or sorry, arithmetic operations. Um, but in C, that's not actually how it works. The way this works in C, and I'm sure people know this, but I'm just going to rehash it. Oh, and, and, uh, and, and you might do it like this, right? Um, uh, the way that works in C is A is promoted to an int, b is promoted to an int, uh, uh, is then adding two ints, yielding an int. Um, uh, the int is implicitly converted to a char. So that's essentially the process from the C compiler's point of view. Is in, in this expression here, it first promotes a and b um, Uh, it first converts a and b to int, and I'll talk a little bit about what the different options are for this, but uh, for now, let's just say that these get promoted to ints, and these are called the, I think they used to be called the default integer promotions, but the standard now just calls them the integer promotions. And um, and then once you've promoted those, the so-called uh, usual arithmetic conversions take over. Now, in this case, those arithmetic conversions don't actually do anything additional because you've already promoted these to ints, and so you're actually just adding two things of the same type, and there's no conversions necessary. Uh, and so the result is just you know, the common type, which is the int. Uh, and then it's implicitly converted back to a char. And um, the reason you can get away for being a C programmer for a fairly long time without ever quite realizing this is how it works is because of this implicit conversion here. The fact that the end is implicitly converted back to a char means that you can write stuff like this and it just seems to, like the types fit, right? Like, oh, A plus B can be assigned to a char and that kind of fit my model of how it worked in the first place. So maybe that's kind of how it works. Um, and in addition, um, as long as you're only doing addition, subtraction, and multiplication, at least without signed integer overflow, which is undefined in C, um, the additional thing that makes this kind of hidden or easy to not confront, I guess, as a programmer, is that so-called temporary overflow is okay, right? Like as long as you're you're only dealing with unsigned arithmetic, meaning um, even if if I'm if I'm going to add these two things, and I guess maybe I should say unsigned char just to uh, avoid because char can be signed. Unfortunately, there's a weird thing in the C where char can be signed or unsigned. Um, but let's take that. Let's take signed overflow out of the equation. Um, the fact is, even if this computation was done, um, like. If, if we do it with wider precision for the intermediate computation and then convert it uh, to a narrower type at the end, it would it would be the same as if we had done all the intermediate steps with a narrower uh, precision, right? Um, and, and I mean, this is maybe it would be more it would be more it would be better better illustration if there were like more uh, operands, but like if you if you have something like this. Uh, this is the same as doing the, the full computation without any modding and then modding out at the end. Um, 
this is a little bit uh, like this explanation is not supposed to make total sense if you don't know what I'm talking about here. But uh, anyway, the point is one of the reasons that it's easy to get away with this flawed mental model of how C works is that for most operations, it doesn't really matter. If you end up assigning the final result to a narrow type uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter for almost any case that it is unsigned that you uh, actually had wider precision for all the intermediate steps because you throw all that information away at the end and it would have been the same uh, at the end, if you, even if you had done everything in the intermediate stages with the narrow type. Um, the main case where this differs is if you have uh, right shifts or there's probably other cases, but like right shifts or divisions. Because for example, um, suppose you have, uh, this is based on an example someone brought up on the Discord this weekend, so I'm just going to use it. But suppose you have, um, like, I don't know, suppose you're trying to do um, a, saturated, a saturated addition is actually good. So let's call it, let's say, saturated addition. Um, so you have two operands uh, that are unsigned, uh, unsigned here. And then, um, well, in this case, it really does matter, right? Um, you can do this and... Um, you know, you can say if this is wider than, uh, if this is wider than this, then that otherwise do this. So something like this. In a case like this, it really does matter that the intermediate precision is wider because if this addition was done with only eight bits of precision, then this would wrap around, and this would actually would be this could never be true, right? Because it would wrap around. So the maximum value would be two fifty fifty five, and this would be. A tautology this would always be the equivalent to just passing c directly um, but this is a case where it really does matter so things that are based on I, I guess i guess this is another one so there's division and right shifting and just i guess comparisons in general it really does matter that you have more intermediate precision um, but for things where you're just doing like plus minus multiplies and stuff it really doesn't matter and so you don't notice for the most part but anyway this is how c actually works for this case um, let me talk about cases that are less clear cut. And, and this is where maybe some of the scary stuff enters. Um, suppose that you have, um, I'm just gonna say signed in. I'm just gonna say, this, this means the same thing, but uh, actually let me write it really explicitly. Um, say you have something like this. Um, now I'm not going to, well, my, my question is what is the type of A plus B? Um, so in this case, um, well, first, um, uh, A is not promoted, B is not promoted. <clears throat> so first off, the, the precursor step to the conversion is always to do promotions on the operands individually. So the thing about promotions is promotion doesn't take into account the context. It's just regardless of what it's being added to, whatever combination it's occurring in, first you do the promotions. And those are just looking at one operand in isolation. So anyway, A and B in this case are not promoted basically because they're already of, they've already been, their, their rank is already like, you know, they can't be promoted any further by the, by those rules. Um, and then when you, uh, this is kind of an edge case for the conversion rules, but uh, ultimately uh, is computed. Uh, sorry. So so now the problem is uh, here we started with two things. Uh, and actually, maybe it's worth mentioning that even if this had been a short, um, let's, let's do it like this. Um, something like this. The two operands are originally of different types, right? One is a char and the other is a short. Um, but after the promotion step, they've now been promoted to a common type. And so by the time the plus operator actually sees them, it's adding two types that are the same. So there's no real conversion. There's no conversion necessary. Only the promotion was necessary. Um, in this case here, the promotion rules don't actually do anything. They leave the type as they were. So now you're dealing with A plus B, uh, where A and B are uh, don't have the same type. Um, and... In this case, the way it works, and this is just how C defines it, and we can maybe talk about why that's a good or a bad idea, but this is how it defines it in any case. Um, so they, they have to convert to common type. Um, um, and, and the way it does it is um, C, uh, the, the C spec um, dictates that, um, that that's the signed, signed ant is converted to unsigned it. 
Um, so essentially, you can think of it like, like, uh, like this. Uh, how the sum is computed. The result is unsigned. Um, so that's how that works. So this is a case where the promotions don't uh, kind of accidentally generate a common type, and then the conversion actually needs to do some work in order to find a common type for the operands. And this case here is kind of annoying because you know, if you wanted to do a lossless computation, you could imagine promoting them to like, you know, if, if, if int is 32 bits, you could imagine promoting to some sort of signed 64-bit quantity. And that would be able, to, in the same way that if you take a signed short and an unsigned short, promoting both of those to signed ints would let you do, would, would let you embed both types in some lossless wider type um, and do the computation there. You can imagine C could have decided to say, hey, let's promote these things to signed int 64s. Uh, which, I mean, like uh, signed long, long, right? Something like that, assuming that was wide enough to accommodate them and then do the computation there. But that's not how it defined it. Um, and in any case, even if it had to find things that way, um, you would just kick the can down the road because what, it, what you know, um, what if you were adding signed long, long and an unsigned long, long? Uh, there, now, now you're kind of out of room. You can't really promote this to anything else. So anyway, C doesn't do that. But even if it had done that, it would just uh, raise the question of what do you do in this case here with the uh, long, long. All right. Um, so that was one case that's kind of tricky. Um, in general, the way the rules work is you do the promotions, and we'll talk about exactly what the rules are for promotions. But then when you get past the promotions and you're doing the conversions, it basically tries to convert from the narrower thing to the wider thing. So for example, um, I believe this is, actually, let, let me look up that case because now I'm not 100% sure. I think it always promotes to the wider ranked, to the wider rank. Why is it not bringing up? Sorry, it's not bringing up my, uh, my PDF viewer. Um, let's see here, arithmetic conversions. Actually, let, let me just explain how it works uh, first. Let, let me go through the promotions first and then the conversions and we'll look at what the standard says. Um, so um, let's look for the promotions. Right, so this is almost exactly the case we looked at. Um, but this is maybe talking about some representation stuff rather than the, but you can see here it says, um, both of these are promoted to int size and then those are added and then finally it's truncated. Um, So what section is this? This is the conversion section. This is the conversion section. Um, right, and you can see it first defines a notion of rank and the idea behind rank is um, um, you're supposed to have this linear ranking of types according to, it, it's only really like it, roughly, core, like let, let me write out the kind of thing that they have in mind. Like they want to have this kind of rank assignment that that goes something like this, um, you know, something along those lines. Um, and the idea is that this represents what is conceptually at least as wide as things in the previous uh, of the lower ranks. Um, the thing that's uh, that they mention here in the first uh, item is that even if they have the same representation, they're not supposed to have the same rank. What, what I mean is, so for example, with the standard ABI on x64, and I guess this is true on both Windows and Linux and Mac, uh, int and long actually are the same representation. They're both 32-bit. So long is not really wider than int. Nevertheless, long has wider has higher rank than int. That's the idea. Um, so that's the no, that, that's why this ranks concept is is uh, is there. Uh, it doesn't necessarily reflect whether 
um, you know, C, does, C, does, C has this, so let me write this in parallel since it's probably good to illustrate the point. Um, C does dictate that the size of these types and what, what values they can represent uh, have these inequalities, but you can see the inequalities is less than or equal to, not strictly, uh, strictly less than, um, whereas the ranks are strict. So even though on the standard x64 ABI, these two things are actually the same size and have the same representable range of values, uh, long has strictly higher rank than int uh, for, the, for the sake of doing um, conversions. So that's the notion of rank. Um, right, you can see they, they say here what I, I guess, yeah, you have to say signed because it's not automatically signed, you don't know. Um, And then what do they say about unsigned, right? Um, and like signed T is equal to rank unsigned T. So two, two signed and unsigned counterparts have the same rank. Um, and then let's see here. This is just saying that rank is transitive. Um, and then here are the default integer conversions, or sorry, no, this is the promotions, the integer promotions. You can see anything that has integer conversion ranked less than or equal to rank of int or unsigned int um, can be used in a context where one of those is expected. So meaning uh, anything to the left of here can be used in a context where an int or an unsigned int is expected. That's basically what we were talking about up here. Those are the integer uh, promotions. And then there's some special stuff here for bool and, uh, and whatnot. Um, and the way it decides when it's doing the promotions, the way it decides between int and unsigned int has to do with whether it can accommodate the all values of the original type. So for example, um, uh, basically, well, let me put it this way. Short is effectively always 16-bit, right? But it, it would actually be legal according to the C standard for short to be 32-bit and be the same width as, as int. And if that were the case, then, unsigned short could not be promoted to signed int because you know it would already be like it would not be all the values of unsigned short in that case would not be representable but practically on the systems we care about short is always strictly uh narrower than int and as a result uh the rules they're talking about here essentially amount to saying anything that's short whether signed or unsigned always gets promoted to a signed int that's it um, that's basically the bottom line. As long as short is strictly narrower than int, that's always the case. So either signed short or unsigned short or signed char or unsigned char, they all get promoted to int when you're doing the integer promotion. Um, that's basically what it boils down to. And then as they say, all other types are unchanged by the integer promotions. So if you have a long long or something like that, um, something that cannot be represented, so something, well, well, let's see here, yeah. Uh, basically, those don't get changed at all by the promotions, right? Um, and you can say that they say that they preserve value, including sign. What they mean by this is that, un unlike the integer, con unlike the arithmetic conversions, which we'll get to in a second, the promotions themselves can never change the value. So you can't, um, like up here, um, when you do this conversion from signed int to unsigned int, that actually changes the value, right? If a was minus one, when you do this conversion, it actually changes the value. It can't be minus one anymore because unsigned int doesn't have a value called minus one, right? So the conversions can actually change values, but integer promotions can never change values. Um, so that's what that what that is saying here. So the promotion are a pure, you can think of them as being a purely lossless conversion. They never change values. They just embed values in potentially wider types. All right. Um, and let me just remind me, see if there's anything I should cover here. Right, so this is pertinent to. Um, look at this paragraph here. This is pertinent to the case I just covered. When you're converting from, um, from a signed type to an unsigned type, um, and you have a value. Um, that cannot be directly represented in the new unsigned type. So for example, here we have minus one. Um, the, the conversion from unsigned to signed, sorry, from signed to unsigned is well-defined as follows. 
um, repeater, well, uh, and this would be true also for converting from, for example, a signed int 64 to an unsigned int 32, where uh, the problem is not that it's, uh, well, the problem is not necessarily that it's negative, that any particular value is negative, but it could be wider as well. It's basically going to compute the modulo of the of the maximum value plus one of the new type. So this is just another way of saying that this is a two's complement. Um, do they have a footnote here? Okay, so they don't really say that. But basically, uh, uh, signed unsigned conversion acts as if uh, two's complement. Um, actual machine. Uh, signed integer rep need not be two's complement, but on two's complement machines, the conversion is just passed through. Um, so that's basically how they define the conversion here: is to say, you know, if you have minus one, for example, um, uh, let's see, signed. Is uh, uint max um, minus one, or sorry, plus one minus one. I guess just, or if you want to, you can write it like this if you want to write it exactly like the standard writes it. Um, no, that's not right. It's the narrower type. Um, let's see. The maximum value that can be represented in the new type. Yeah, so that should be u int max. Um, one more than the maximum value that could be represented, which is u int max. Yeah, no, that's right. Okay. Um, so that's how the conversion works here. And this is basically just a two's complement conversion. But the important point is that C itself actually takes pain in other parts of the standard to allow you to have non-twos complement machines, even though almost all machines that are relevant nowadays, except maybe for ancient mainframes or whatever, are twos complement. But in this case, for this specific kind of conversion, it says that the conversion should act as if you were having just a twos complement conversion. And the implication is that on twos complement machines, they don't have to do any additional work. If you're like on a sign magnitude or once complement machine, this step will actually take some additional instructions to execute. But if you're on a twos complement machine, like any machine that you have access to most likely, this essentially just amounts to taking the existing value in a register or a memory location, but now interpreting it as being unsigned rather than signed. But you don't actually have to do any computation. Um, so that's how they, they, they define that. Um, and in the case where you have something like um, for example, I don't know. Um, I mean, this is, I guess, pretty intuitive as well. Something like UN64, if you're con converting, um, I don't know, if you're converting UN64 max to this, the way this is converted is now you have to subtract in order to make it narrow. Um, and it would be something like this, which would be um, I guess would actually just wind up being, let's see here, I guess like that, right? Yeah, this is what the, the, the I think the math would work out to in this case. Um, and again, this is just like masking off the top bit, like the top 32 bits or whatever. Um, but it defines it not in terms of bits, but in terms of this kind of modulo computation where it's adding or subtracting. Um, the maximum value plus one of the new type. All right, um, sorry, this is uh, a little bit all over the place, but I wanted to cover the high points before we uh, start talking about how you handle this in code. Um, the, the other part of this, of course, is that all the arithmetic operations can be used not just with, uh, with integer types, but with floating point types as well, both single and double precision. And in fact, C defines what it calls extended double precision, which is like long double, but we're not going to deal with that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so what, what it basically says, you know, for I mean, this is pretty obvious. When you convert from float to integer, the fractional part is discarded, so it's truncated towards zero, not rounded. Um, if the integer part cannot be represented, blah, 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 it's undefined. 
Um, and, and I mean, it, it says sort of the obvious stuff. Uh, since we're not really compiling things to machine code, we don't have to worry too much about those, but it says the obvious stuff in terms of, you know, generally when you do conversions, if you, you try to preserve the value, right? Um, so if you're converting from, I don't know, if you're converting from UNT64 to float, if the UNT64 value can be represented exactly as a, a single precision float or a double precision float or whatever, then it's represented exactly. Otherwise it does some kind of, uh, truncation. Yeah, you can see the nearest representable value to that. So it's kind of mostly doing the obvious stuff for that. Um, and for these promotions, when it's doing these widening floating point uh, promotions, it's unchanging the value. Um, boom, boom, boom. Right, so here we get to the usual arithmetic conversions. Um, this is really where the, the meat is. And again, the point of the arithmetic conversions is when we're adding or subtracting or multiplying things and stuff like that, or even comparing them, uh, we have to convert them to a common type. And for some cases, uh, just doing the promotions beforehand is enough to con to uh, get a common type. But other cases like the signed int versus unsigned int, it's not sufficient. And we have to do some actual work beyond that. Um, and so this section here is describing that. Let's see. Um, boom, 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 boom. Right, and the common type is also, unless otherwise stated, the result type. Uh, okay, here. Um, so here it's talking about hand, how to handle kind of floating point operations. And let's ignore the long double stuff, but basically there's this kind of if else chain of decisions here. But basically what it's saying is if you're adding double um double plus int double plus float uh i don't know uh double double plus char um the, the integers are all converted to floats to doubles similar for for floats um so this is i think kind of what you expect and i should also say actually yeah double plus float was already here um it's converted to a double. Um, so that's what they're saying there. And so this is an implicit conversion again, right? Like all the stuff we're talking about so far is totally implicit. Um, you don't have to do explicit conversions. It's just something that happens as a side effect of doing these operations. And so once we're done with the floating point stuff, now you do, oh, right, this is where first you, then so, so this handles all the floating point stuff. And then done with that, we first we do the integer promotions on both operands. So this is the stuff we talked about before, which um, for narrower things tries to promote them to int or uint basically, otherwise leaves them alone. Uh, and then again, if both types after doing the promotions are the same type, then we don't need to do any further conversion. And so for example, uh, in the very first case here where we were we took an unsigned char and an unsigned short and they both get promoted to ints. Now we're just adding two ints and the conversions don't actually do anything. Uh, the promotions did all the work. But um, otherwise, this is where things get more complex, basically. Um, and, the, and the basic idea is that um, if you have two things that have the same signedness, so they're both signed or both unsigned, you always take the thing of lesser rank and promote it to the higher rank. So if you add a uh, an int 32 and an int 64, an int 32 and an int 64, they're both signed ints, right? Uh, it's going to promote the int 32 to the int 64 because int 64 has higher rank than the int 32. And similarly with uint 32 and uint 64, that's the idea. And actually this would also be true if one of them, if, if you had a signed int plus a signed long, even though on a given machine, int and long might have the same representation, the, you know, the same size, the, the same set of representable values, technically, in this case, uh, you're promoting int to long, even on a machine where that really doesn't mean anything because they're the exact same representation. Under the hood, in some sense, if you had a way of seeing what the type actually was that it was using for that conversion, it would actually be converting the int to the long, okay? Um, and so this case here handles when they're both signed or unsigned, right? Uh, this case, uh, this case is for uh, one one of the operand is unsigned, 
and the other is signed. And what it does is, let's see, the unsigned, you have a mixed signed and unsigned. Um, and the unsigned operand has greater or equal rank to the, yeah, so this one is interesting. So if you have, let's see here, if you have, um, say, short, well, that's not a good one. Let's take um, long, long plus, oh, that's fine. Uh, let's say unsigned int plus um, long, long, or even long, actually, which is actually a tricky one because, yeah, this one is actually pretty interesting. No, that would not be the right one. So unsigned long plus int. Um, this case here would hit this clause because what it's basically saying is the unsigned int has rank greater or equal to. In fact, long is strictly greater rank than int. Regardless of whether they have the same underlying representation in the machine, they, long has strictly greater rank than int, and it's unsigned. And so this would uh, convert signed int to unsigned long. Um, right, that sounds correct. That sounds correct. Uh, so that's what it states. Basically, if the unsigned, when you have a mixed signedness of these two things, you owe, if the unsigned operand is at least high, as high rank as the other one, you always promote to the unsigned part. So this is also what accounts for um, this thing here. So these actually have the same rank, right? The signed and unsigned int have the same rank, but you always promote to the unsigned operand type. So this is what happens here, but it would also be the, the case if you had unsigned long and signed it, for example, it would promote to unsigned long. Um, all right, um, let's see here. Otherwise, if the type of the operand was signed, int type can represent all of the values of the type of the unsigned, then right. So this is saying um, if, so assuming these previous two cases don't match, if, um, if the operand with assigned int type, basically if the operand with assigned int type is wide enough to accommodate the other one, then that one wins. So for example, uh, int 64, signed int 64, uh, plus unsigned int 32, uh, you know, unsigned int 32 is promoted to signed int 64 because in 64 is wide enough to accommodate. So interestingly, this is not a, a lot of the previous stuff was based on rank, but this conversion here is based on whether the signed type is can accommodate all values of the unsigned type. So it's not looking at rank. It's looking at like, what's the word it uses? It can, it can represent all values of the type with the unsigned, of the operand with the unsigned type, yeah. Um, and if even that isn't possible, for example, um, Let's see, both operands are converted to the unsigned integer type corresponding to the type of the operand with signed. So this is like we make an unsigned version of the other one. Um, so this would be, let me think. Um, what would be a case of that? Maybe signed long, Uh, signed long plus unsigned. I'm actually not sure for that last paragraph what an example of that would be. Hmm. What case would trigger that? So this is ruled out that they have the same signedness. So once we're here, we have a signed versus unsigned combination. And this rules out the case where the unsigned operand type is 
greater than or equal in rank from the other one. Uh, and this is where the signed type is wide enough to accommodate all values of the unsigned type. And so this is the fallback case. I'm actually not sure what can hit this case. I wonder if anyone in chat can see. Um, So I see Sean is here. Um, Sean, do you know what actually, what cases can fall in this uh, final paragraph or final final case? I, I want to just, it's possible this can't actually occur with any of normal machines I'm used to, but I like the decision tree here is complicated enough that I don't see offhand what falls into this case. Do, do you know offhand what, uh, or anyone else for that matter, not just Sean? Uh, does anyone know what case will trigger this? We've already spent almost over an hour, so it's possible we won't get to the coding in this stream, and then I'll move it to the extra stream. But I need to sort this out for my own benefit if no one else is uh, anyway before we start coding. This is actually, this case here is one that I hadn't really thought about. Uh, these cases here make sense. Everything previously makes sense. But this one here, I'm not sure what falls into that. see if were, someone already mentioned it. All right, uh, let, let me just take a, a second to get a drink. And then um, if no one, I mean, we can move on to some of the coding uh, without necessarily handling this case uh, for now. Like the, the reality is that we're probably only going to handle the stuff we have a way of testing on machines that I know about. And so it's possible it won't implement all of the C semantics in this area. But I would like to at least know, even if this is impossible in the cases, in the, in the common cases, I would at least like to know a hypothetical case that would trigger this. And I know people who know more about the standard. I can ask after the stream as well. But let me just get a drink and then I'll start coding. All right, um, maybe we should just start coding and then if someone, um, feel, feel free to open your own version of the standard and look at and look at this final part and let me know if you can think of a concrete case, even a hypothetical concrete case that would, um, that would trigger this and uh, then we'll revisit that maybe in the Q&A. Um, all righty, so <clears throat> that, that's how C works and I want to have at least a subset of that behavior um, even if we don't handle that, so some some of the, the really weird stuff that doesn't really manifest in practice. Um, if you look at what we're doing right now with um, with integer and arithmetic stuff in the type system, uh, the only thing that's really fully supported is int. Um, we have a char type, but it doesn't behave arithmetically. Like you can't actually uh, you can't actually like do arithmetic on chars or anything like that. We also have floats, um, and we, you know, we have float literals and so on. But you also, right now, can't do arithmetic on floats. And one of the reasons I wanted to defer some of that work on the type system is that I was trying to figure out some of the stuff I just talked about in terms of how we're going to handle it. Um, and I have a pretty decent idea of how to start, at least. Um, so first off, let's fill this in with uh, other other things, other kinds of types, uh, and we're going to basically just have the C set of C things. So um, let's see, uh, short, u short, u int and u int, long and u long, um, and long long and u long long. Um, we also need double here. I don't want long double because no one, I don't think I've ever seen that used in practice. So I'm just going to leave that out. So, all right, um, those are uh, those are just the kinds, and now we have to fill in some of these guys as well. Um, 
and I mean it's it's just going to be uh, fairly repetitive, but I'll just quickly do this. So this is short, new short. These are going to be two. This information, by the way, should move to the back end sooner than uh, at some point soon. Right now, I'm just putting in the resolver, but really, this depends on the target architecture. But I'm just inlining all that information here for convenience. Um, This is going to be eight bytes. All right. Um, let's see here. We need doubles as well. All right, um, so the way I imagine this working is, let's move past some of this stuff. I don't know where the best place to put it, but somewhere, I guess around here maybe, um, I imagine we're going to have something called promote operand. Actually, rather than returning a new thing, uh, let me just have it operate in place. And so you will call this on something when you want to do the integer promotions uh, to it. And so, um, let's do it this way. It has a type. And um, again, this is, I'm going to hard code this for something that behaves like x64. A lot of this stuff should really be moved to be driven by backend information rather than being like this here. But, um, I, I, this is, it's easier for me to get concrete uh, g given what I know about the given architecture, then we can maybe factor that out later. Um, and so let me just get the list up here. And actually, I guess maybe if I'm clever, I can, well, actually, let me use switch. I don't want to be prematurely optimizing. Um, So in this case, we want to basically um, I guess there's two cases we have to consider um, because we have to deal with constants as well. So that's an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. Yeah, well, um, so for all of these cases, we will just promote to type int um, and we don't do anything in other case um, let us um, let us revisit this um, const val And uh, let's have a bunch of different things for constants. Um, so let's see here. Um,
this is going to generate a well I, I think not too many cases because anytime I was thinking about whether this is going to crazily bifurcate our constant expression evaluator I don't think it's going to be too bad because basically the two cases we have to deal with is ints long longs floats and doubles um, and we don't actually do float and double constant evaluation we don't need to we can defer that um, so it's really only sort of the 32-bit and 64-bit cases we actually need to do that for um, because everything else gets promoted so I think that's fine that shouldn't be too bad um, so anyway it's going to be something like this and and then you can do that Actually, I guess we have to handle the unsigned. Let me think about it. Can we get away with only doing I think we can get away with only doing the 64-bit signed and unsigned math and then just truncating it for uh, the 32-bit case. Um, let, let me leave this one for now. Um, and actually, I think the correct thing to do here is you do this and then you I just factor it out. Um, and this is const. All right. Let's revisit all of this stuff. So here we get a, some stuff back. Um, cannot convert from blah to blah. Okay. Maybe just call this val to be honest. Um, the fact that it's constant is kind of all right. Um, And let's say cannot convert from val to oh I see so this should be I.
So this is going to have to be replaced, but for now I want to just get the old stuff working with the new representation. Um, someone's asking about the public repository. You can go to the links. Uh, there's a GitHub link um, for the project as a whole. All right. Um, this is already validating that they're ints, right? So. Hmm, this is an interesting case. We should probably, um, for this case here, um, I feel like all integer literals should be represented by the same node, but they should have some sort of, I don't know, modifier or like um, there should be some sort of int literal. Um, But you know what? Let's just make it a plain int for now, um, and and not su let's not support wider literals for for now. It's probably the way to do it. Um, Mm. This one's a little bit annoying because size of is a type def. Um, let's just Mm. 
I mean, since, since all the values we have here kind of assume a 64-bit uh, architecture, let's just say this is uh, U long long. Oh, no, that didn't work. Oh yeah, I guess that won't work. Eh. Let's just be dirty. Type size T. Type, type size of. Resolve constant expression. Yeah, so resolve constant expression should definitely be changed to returning a val. And I guess that's really not sufficient anymore. It should return an operand. And, uh, Um, let's see. So here, in theory, we can get, well, let me think about what the right way to handle this is. Um, get it. we know we have a constant, but let's see, uh, is integer type size type? Oh, we on time. Okay, I'm a little bit over time, but I'm going to keep going because we didn't do a lot of coding today. Um, let's see. So we need some kind of way of detecting integer types. Uh, array size. As an expression, must have integer type. Um, then I would say convert operand um, hmm. So in theory, this could be pretty much any type, integer type at this point. Um, Um, No, you know what? Let's just do it like that. Um, 
Okay, what was the thing we were looking at? It was for the size. Um, let's just say it has to be an integer for now, like straight up, just to simplify it. Probably makes sense to have I mean it's kind of the same thing we just did. Okay, chances of this working are low. Okay. Okay, that means there is an assert. Um, oh, here. And we don't have line information for this, so let it must have things that are um. Fatal error. Uh, type sec. Because it's the very first line. I see. It's because we're using size of. So let's just change size of to have a type int for now. Okay, that actually works. Um, what are people saying? All right, yeah, maybe maybe I'll do Q&A, and then I'll switch over to the extra stream. I'll keep working on this, um, but uh, the stream is already uh, one hour and 45 minutes. So uh, let me just see if there's any questions, and then we'll cut off to the extra stream after that. Um, someone's asking, I'd like to understand why from a language syntax design, not everything is like Lisp, and then you write macros on top of the language. You want to create a nicer syntax, but the core is simpler. No, that's kind of an open-ended question. So even Lisp itself originally, um, if you read the original paper from John McCarthy, um, I mean, this is a sidetrack, but it's the kind of sidetrack I like doing. 
uh, John McCarthy, Lisp, symbolic uh, paper, was it recursive expressions? I'm trying to remember what the paper was called. Oh yeah, recursive functions of symbolic expressions. There was originally supposed to be a part two of this paper. Um, and he was talking about something called M expressions in the original paper, which were intended to be kind of the higher level syntax, more human readable and infix and so on, which were built on top of S expressions. Um, but no one, basically no one ever ended up doing that because you, you lose a bunch of the benefits once you're no longer homo iconic. Um, and I mean, there have been various attempts over the years at doing something where the substrate is S expressions and then everything is built on top of it with grammars. But w one of the problems is as soon as you're dealing with kind of normal infix syntax, it's a lot harder to support arbitrary syntax extension in a way that's clean, the way macros are clean. Um, the language I would recommend you check out if you're interested in this is Dylan, which was designed by a lot of original um, com Lisp and Common Lisp, I guess Mac Lisp and Common Lisp people from, from a lot of MIT people, for example. Um, this is an infix language. It has sort of a Common Lisp-like or a, a Lisp-like uh, substrate in some way, but it's still infix, but it also has fairly limited ways you can extend it. Uh, and it's very much not bootstrapped starting from Lisp and just doing uh, a syntax on top of it at the same time. So I don't know. Uh, the answer is that S expressions, uh, it, if, if you're going to have everything at the low level be S expression based, then keeping the surface language also be S expression based keeps things pretty nice and clean. Like it means that macros are feel part of the language and so on and macros are easy to write and whatnot if you try to build a infix sort of modern infix style language on top of s expressions the equivalent of macros get really complex you either have to restrict macros and sort of infix macros to be very basic or infix macros become quite complex where you have to write a little parser every time or something so the answer is that this stuff has been tried and in fact goes back to the original mccarthy paper from 1960 or whatever this paper came out, yeah, 1960. Um, but most people have found in practice that actual as expression syntax is the sweet spot. So if you want as expressions, just use as expressions. And if you want higher level stuff, um, in my opinion, syntactic extensibility does not gel very well with normal alcohol style syntax. Um, anyway, not a very coherent argument, but. Um, the point is that the whole notion of M expression goes back to the original Lisp paper and was tried and basically thrown out by the Lisp community in several over several iterations. And I don't know anyone who considers themselves a Lisper who still thinks that's a good idea. All right. Um, Oh yeah, someone's pointing out that actually 64-bit Linux has size of long equal to eight, which is, yeah, I forgot about that. You're right, it's just int that's four and size of long uh, is that. So, and I mean, th that's a good example of why I should probably move this to the back end. But for now, I'm just, I, unless I'm totally mistaken, I think, uh, I think this is, Four. I could be wrong about that, to be honest, because it's I, I never use longs, right? So um, for all I know, even on Windows, I'm totally wrong. Let me just check. Because I basically never use longs, so. No, it is four on Windows. All right, so that's probably a good argument for moving that into the back end. Um, let me just write a note here. <clears throat> dun, dun, dun. Uh, someone's asking about moving the compiler over to ion itself yeah i mean that's the goal eventually but only when it makes practical sense um 
I, the ion compiler is complicated enough that it's not totally trivial to do that. So I'm only going to do it once it starts making practical sense, which is not not for a while. Uh, step one is to do step one is to do well, what we're doing now, basically finishing that off, where we're generating C for development on the host. Step two is cross compiling from the host to the target system, generating RISC-V machine code directly. Step three, which is the self-hosting part, which is in the future, far, not far future, but definitely uh, not, not anytime soon, is to make it self-hosting so we can run the compiler on the system itself. So we cross compile using the original C-based backend, cross compile the, the, the ION and ION compiler to the target system and then run it on there. But really until we have enough of a system where it would be useful to run a compiler directly on it, not cross compiling, but running it directly on it, uh, there's no point practically in doing the boot, the self-hosting and the bootstrapping that way. But uh, yeah, eventually I'd like to do it. But um, it's a bunch of work uh, for no good reason, especially since the language implementation right now is not stable. Um, what is the reason to have the long type in ION anyway? Well, the reason is we need to interoperate. For host development, we need to interoperate with the the host and its libraries. And I mean, C itself has a bunch of things that are uh, uses longs, like uh, ftel, right? ftel uses long. Um, what's the other one? Yeah, I, I guess you're kind of supposed to use this nowadays because um, the problem with long only being four bits is you can only use ftel with short files. I think f f post is supposed to be uh, at least 64 bits or something like that, or at least more flexible. But anyway, the, the answer is that I want to be able, you know, there's kind of two use cases for ION. One is for host development, where we want to be able to talk to C libraries, and those C libraries are going to use longs. And so we want to be able to express that in our type system, even if they're not, you know, something I use very much myself in my code. Uh, it is in the C standard library, and it might be in other third-party libraries. So that's really the major reason. And uh, once you're once you're going 90%, you might, might as well include all the standard C types that make sense. Like not long double, but at least this set of things uh, should be pretty complete for what we need. And then there's going to be type defs, of course, but these are the built-in types. Like size T is a type def, int32 is a type def, all those things. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to stop recording and then start re-recording and just continue working on this because I want to get some traction on filling this stuff in. So, uh, yeah, uh, we spent some time looking at the standard, kind of confusing ourselves maybe a little bit, but uh, let's let's start actually implementing a bunch of this stuff with the promotions and the conversions after I cut off the stream and restart it. So see you in a sec.